look, I think it's important to realize that in a European Union that has nearly 30 members, you are going to have genuinely legitimate differences of views on the use of military power, on the use of economic power. And those legitimate differences are based in relative size, in location, whether you're close to Russia or not, whether you are economically powerful or not, or whether you are small and less powerful and have to bandwagon on big countries like France and, and, and Germany. All that, you know, creates its own tensions that I think, you know, can't, can't be sort of smoothed over or skipped over even in at times of, of a real crisis that, that does, as Celia was saying, sort of glue us all together. I'm Lawfare Senior Editor Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for March 14th, 2022. Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine has undermined some of the fundamental assumptions underlying the security of Europe through much of the post-World War II era. As a result, several European nations have begun to consider dramatic changes in how they approach national security, both individually and collectively. To better understand how the war in Ukraine is reshaping the European security order, I sat down with two of my colleagues from the Brookings Institution. Celia Belen, a visiting fellow at Brookings and a former official in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Constanze Stoltenmüller, the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations in the Center on the United States and Europe. We discussed how the Ukraine conflict is reshaping Europe's approach to security affairs, what this means for institutions like the European Union and NATO, and how these changes are likely to impact the fundamental debate over what it means to be a part of Europe. It's the Lawfare Podcast for March 14th, How Ukraine is Changing European Security. Celia, Constanza, I want to start with a broad question. In the last three weeks, uh, and the weeks leading up to that, we had a strong sense this was coming, we've seen a pretty major event happen that at least according to a lot of people, is shaking some of the foundational assumptions about European security, although perhaps reinforcing some older assumptions underlying some of our institutions that that some people thought moment may have passed. Tell us a little bit about what the Ukraine crisis has meant to Europeans and the conception of European security, what it means to have national security and or regional security in the context of Europe. What's changed about how Europeans are thinking about that? Celia, let me start with you. Thank you, Scott. To be fair, uh, waking up on February 24th uh, in Europe, as as I've been told, has been an extreme shock. The United States has been, um, you know, consulting with its allies and explaining how many, uh, you know, Russian troops were amassing on the borders of Ukraine and how an invasion was uh, possible. We had seen diplomacy uh, happening, but for regular Europeans, and I can tell you for regular French people that I have been able to talk to uh, since then, this has truly been a, a shock, a shock that you could have a territorial invasion of a European country by a major nuclear power threatening directly the sovereignty of a smaller European country has been perceived as something unfathomable, impossible to imagine uh, just a few weeks ago, and that would change the the, the fate of Europe and, and, and history. As uh, Emmanuel Macron, a French president, said last week, um, for a lot of people, this um, has been the significance of a return of tragedy in history, that history could be tragic again. And, um, you know, of course, you you have seen uh, media or regular people talk about World War III, the risk there. So I I would just point out this this idea of a shock first and foremost. Constanza, do you want to add anything there? I mean, I agree with Celia, um, everything that she said. I, I would say that I was, I had been fearing this for a while. I thought that the signs were on the horizon because of Putin's and the Kremlin's rhetoric from, say, late November. I went to Germany in late November, early December for the first time in a long time uh, during the pandemic and got the impression that people who were watching the signs closely were profoundly worried about the possibility of a war. And I think what we are seeing here is, is the leader of a major power committing war crimes. And in in a way that I think revives institutions 
international institutions and legal questions and political questions that indeed we thought we were not going to you know had been had been laid to rest um with the trump era and perhaps even under the biden administration and i think we're all uh, all digesting that in given the horrific images coming out of ukraine and from refugees and internally displaced persons and the sort of mass casualties in cities that are being bombarded indiscriminately going in to this latest ukraine crisis the european union had articulated a kind of five pillars policy towards approaching russia uh since around 2018 i think is when this kind of formula got fully rolled out it basically consisted of tying sanctions relief to compliance with the minsk agreements engaging in your relations with the former Soviet republics, building relationships with them uh, outside of Russia, of course, building up EU resilience to Russian threats, I think both on the cyber domain, conventional military domain, kind of across, across the gamut there, selective engagement with Russia, continued diplomatic engagement, and then supporting Russian civil society and kind of people-to-people programs, uh, cultural exchange, economic ties, things like that. What does the Ukraine crisis do to those pillars? Which of those pillars stay and which of them go or have to be so substantially changed in the views of European policymakers that that we're going to come up with some sort of is there, we're going to end up with a new formula at the end? What, what is the direction that the EU policy is, is going to take towards Russia after this crisis subsides or perhaps if the crisis becomes a more permanent feature of the, the continent? Celia, I'll start with you as well. Well, I think everything has changed, uh, truthfully. Uh, First of all, because we're not talking about a crisis anymore. This is not a crisis with Ukraine. This is war. This is invasion of a sovereign country. Obviously, you have the the invasion of Crimea and uh, unrest and and war in the Donbass that should have been uh, sort of the... The, the flag uh, demonstrating that uh, this this was already not a crisis anymore, but this was a war. But I think the EU uh, Europeans were not prepared to view it as such uh, back in in the day. And uh, this time around, the the clear intention of Vladimir Putin to destroy Ukraine's statehood, to uh, destroy its government, to to change its government, to potentially annex Ukraine, or who knows what the end goal is. But clearly, this is uh, the end goal is um, only to, for Putin's perspective, can only be achieved through war. This has changed everything. So I think a smart, uh, you know, a pillar-based policy towards the EU is not appropriate anymore. What's happening now is twofold on, on one side or threefold. On one side, first is the support um, given to Ukraine, and this uh, shall continue. It's a, it's a material support for Ukraine to be able to defend itself. And uh, in the long run, support for humanitarian aid, support for hopefully at some point uh, rebuilding re, uh, and, 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 and strengthening Ukraine as, as, as a country. Then the second pillar is obviously uh, regarding sanctioning uh, Russia, which at this point, I believe because we don't know the end goal of Putin, really resemble a punishing strategy rather than a, a compelling strategy where we try to compel put in and to make uh, decis- different decisions over negotiations at this point is really to make good on the threats we've said that this is a big deal this should be punished this should not go unpunished and and as Constance has mentioned the the war crimes should not face impunity so this whole idea of of punishing or sanctioning Russia is, is very uh, much uh, at the forefront and then, of course, there's this idea of resilience um, for Europe. Uh, Europe really needs to build up its resilience. This, I, these ideas preceded, but now on the front of um, energy, obviously, but uh, defense uh, clearly uh, really strengthening the eastern flank of NATO. And, and more long term, its resilience uh, on uh, against cyber attacks, its resilience also on food security, its resilience on... On, on so many different fronts that should allow the EU to not be in this uh, situation of 
you know, that we've experienced over the past 10 years or since uh, Russia invaded Georgia back in 2008, this idea of compromising with the Russian power because of, um, you know, so many interactions, so many uh, economic interests where we, we might have enabled uh, Putin uh, on the route towards this invasion. So I think I'm not declaring a three pillar strategy because this is go- going to be evolving, but I'm saying that these are going to be the, the main focus for the moment. Constanza, let me turn to you and ask you specifically about the German reaction, because I think Germany seems to have had some of the more fundamental changes or reconsiderations of aspects of its domestic policy, or I should say its internal policy towards the towards the region, towards its internal foreign policy. Some dramatic changes and reconsiderations are we see both Germany, which has a new government, of course, kind of, I think at this point in the first few months after a major change away from Angela Merkel, coming in and saying, we actually are reconsidering our energy relationship, at least in regard to Nord Stream 2, although the broader picture I know is still shaking out. But severing a Nord Stream 2 deal that seems to signal that there's more reluctance to get entangled in energy dependence on Russia. And then perhaps more fundamentally, about facing a, a pretty long-standing policy since World War II to actually provide lethal security assistance to the Ukrainians um, fairly late in the game and after taking a fair amount of criticism for not being willing to do so uh, earlier in the crisis. How is Germany reconsidering its role in Europe and its relationship in regard to Russia? And and how is that likely to impact the kind of emerging European security order that that is coming out of this Ukraine crisis? Well, I think some people would say, me included, that things have been changing in Germany for a while and that this isn't an abrupt departure. I think it seems so to people who aren't Germany watchers, which I understand, and you don't have to be. But it is still, I mean, it it, it is still an extraordinary development uh, in in German security policy. And and I think, if if you will, there was sort of a groundswell of concern uh, of agitation in Berlin at Russia's behavior that really started with uh, Russia's provoking Georgia into a war in 2008, and then the annexation of Crimea, which really uh, significantly shifted perceptions on Russia, not just among policymakers, but also in the general public. That that said, the suspension, but which is really a cancellation of Nord Stream 2, the operating company has since immediately went into insolvency. And the Germany joining joining the West in very, very hard sanctions, and then all the decisions that Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced in a historic speech and a Sunday special meeting of the German Federal Legislature on February uh, Legislature on February 27. Those really, all in all, represent a sea change in German foreign and security policy. And the reason why they're not just performative or declaratory. Is, is that all three parties in this first ever traffic light coalition of Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals had to make real concessions to, to get to that point. Um, the Liberals had to um, basically drop their fiscal hawkishness and the Social Democrats and Greens had to get over some you know very ingrained attitudes to pacifism, uh, weapons deliveries, drones and, and things like that. If you look at the entirety of the list, it's Germany says it will now spend 2% on defense. That means increasing our defense budget by 2024 by 50%, 20, 25 billion euros. We're already at 50, having geared that up from 33 only a few years ago. That's massive. Then there's a special defense fund of 100 billion. The acceleration of the move away from energy dependency, building two new liquid gas, natural gas terminals, buying armed drones, committing to nuclear participation, always contested in Germany, and then sending more troops to reinforce NATO's uh, eastern flank. That, that's that's a lot. And these are things that indeed we were resisting. I, I love the tweet from um, Jeremy Cliff, uh, a, uh, the editor of the New Statesman, former economist correspondent in Berlin, who said, Germany's foreign policy sacred cows are now esteeming part of Rindergulasch, which is the German word for, for beef stew. And that's, you know, that that's really a substantial shift. But I, I think the reason why it happened is that Putin's war has managed to trigger every single 
every single fear that, that Germans have, um, you know, invading sovereign nation on your doorstep, committing war crimes, atrocities against civilians, unleashing a wave of refugees that we haven't seen in Europe or in Germany since the late 1940s, threatening to use nuclear weapons, shooting up nuclear power plants, calling a Jewish president of Ukraine a Nazi. That's probably enough to get Germans going. And and the and the interesting thing is is that if you look at uh, opinion surveys in Germany uh, from right after that speech, they're all for everything that the that the chancellor said. And when you asked and when they asked people whether they were willing to bear costs for that, uh, all of them agreed. Costs like you know energy shortages, higher prices, damage to companies. Yep, two thirds majorities for all of it. Amazing. Celia, this is an interesting point of not a contrast necessarily, but interesting to set next to uh, the kind of French perspective on some of these questions. Because of course, we've heard President Macron make a kind of sustained critique to some extent of, of uh, European security, the state of European security, really for several years now, going back to comments about NATO being brain dead in 2018, 2019, and then coming up more recently, the French foreign minister describing kind of the European security order as nearly obsolete, uh, just on the doorstep, the threshold of this latest crisis. There's clearly a vision that the French government, or at least this French administration, which is, it's worth noting, heading into election in the, in the very near term, which inevitably colors how people approach crises like this. They, they clearly have a conception about what European, what's wrong with European security order, but what is their vision about where it should go? And either for France or for Europe as a whole, and how does Macron's engagement and leadership around around the diplomatic side around this particular issue fit into that? Of course, he's been really notable in being a prominent leader, arguably maybe only, the only prominent leader still keeping up a direct line of communication with Putin. Is that a sign of how France thinks Europe should be approaching security more generally? Does it fit into that picture? Or is this really just a, a product of the strategy for around this particular crisis? So there are many questions in your question and uh, many different angles that could be uh, tackled with this on, on France's relationship to um, not only to Russia, to Ukraine, to the instability in the East, and uh, fundamentally to uh, the uh, European security architecture. It, it, it's manifold because uh, your uh, French foreign policy is manifold um, and has many different interests. And up until quite recently, the main interest, Emmanuel Macron said it only last year, number one priority remained counterterrorism. And so you have to imagine that the first shift that all of France and all of its defense and security apparatus and foreign policy apparatus has to make is the shift from the main threat as not coming from the south, but coming from the east. Uh, I should point out uh, on this regard that um, presidential candidate uh, Eric Zemmour, coming from the far right, a nationalist far right candidate, has just recently called the war in Ukraine a distraction because he believed this, this this is distracting French voters from caring about what he perceives as a civilization threat coming from um, Muslim countries to the south of, of Europe. And uh, so in his paranoia, anti-immigrant stances, he viewed uh, the instability and the war in Ukraine as a distraction. And so but this is just one side of, of French politics. But in general, it colored a sort of all the French decisions for the past uh, 10, 15 years because France was under constant terrorist threat. It has been hit at many different points uh, and in very uh, gruesome uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, France was engaged up until extremely recently uh, heavily in the Sahel uh, region for uh, stability uh, in the Sahel region. And over over only two, three months, this has shifted entirely. First, because um, France has, uh, as you may know, has shifted as a, its a position in, in the Sahel away from Mali, which is now under the uh, the leadership of a military junta that uh, that uh, said that France was not welcome anymore, uh, basically, in, in the country, under pressure of also of Russian mercenaries that are gaining influence in this uh, 
region. And so France was in the process of shifting its resources to other Sahel countries and suddenly uh, sort of change, shift gear and also decided to reinforce NATO's presence in Romania. So you've seen a lot of communications ef- effort to show that, uh, you know, the French armed forces were um, now on the NATO mission in, in Romania. All of this constitutes a major shift in, in, in French uh, foreign policy thinking. And so it's, it's forcing a realization that now is the time to talk about first uh, European uh, territorial defense, to get a, a grammar and a vocabulary around the, the war in Ukraine and the relationship to Russia. It also highlighted the sort of ambiguities in the uh, position of uh, Emmanuel Macron towards Russia. He had uh, launched a, a bilateral security dialogue with Russia in the in the summer of 2019, much to the displeasure of many European allies and had sort of continued this line, this idea that we need a dialogue with such a big power as Russia in in Europe. And this could have put him really at odds with everybody, but he recently shifted from this bilateral approach to a more of a collective approach, which I think uh, sort of helped rewrite a bit of the this this dialogue history that he's got with, with Russia. At the basis, and I'll stop there, of, of this dialogue, there, there was an understanding that the security architecture, namely uh, the arms control treaties of the past that had secured a sort of area of Europe uh, that was mostly at peace. I don't want to exaggerate that. This was this architecture was crumbling under uh, mainly Russian proliferation and also the US leaving some of these treaties. And this crumble of this architecture needed to be faced and the pressures on, regarding Russia needed to be uh, talked about. But I, probably the approach, the, the diagnosis was probably right the approach was wrong. Clearly, it would not be fixed by a bilateral conversation with Russia. It would not be fixed with um, sort of over antagonizing NATO partners. And now we, we've we seen a reshifting uh, of this French position towards a more collective stance. And, and it's welcome. There's no other choice at the moment for than for transatlantic partners to really stick together. So we're seeing, of course, two countries that are kind of the the major powers in Europe, France and Germany, um, among the major powers in Europe, I should say, you know, really rethinking their sort of security posture. And inevitably, that entails the U- Europe more broadly security posture from defense spending to the types of activities we pursue and mostly motivated by the threat from Russia, not the only threat Europe faces or certainly not the only international challenge, but still the most pressing and significant military threat, at least um, at this point. How much daylight is there between these different European perspectives, not just French and German perspectives, but other participants in European communities as well? Are, has this experience of the Ukraine crisis really pushed people in a unified direction towards building up European security in some way or another? Or are there real discrepancies still in what exactly that looks like in practice? Uh, Constanza, let me turn it to you first. Look, I think it's important to realize that in a European Union that has nearly 30 members, you're going to have genuinely legitimate differences of views on the use of military power, on the use of economic power. And those legitimate differences are based in relative size, in location, whether you're close to Russia or not, whether you are economically powerful or not, or whether you, if you are small and less powerful and have to bandwagon on big countries like France and, and and Germany, all that you know creates its own tensions that I think you know can't can't be sort of smoothed over or skipped over even in at times of of a real crisis that that does, as Celia was saying, sort of glue us all together. So that's to be expected and that's normal. And what we do is negotiate our way out of those differences. But it is, I think, a real moment of, of reckoning for the way that we see our role on, on the continent and that we see our security provision. And, and I would just say there are two really important shifts here that we can see. One is the fact that the Europeans are indeed for the first time to supply weapons massively into a neighboring country. 
that that is truly remarkable, particularly for German. But what's even more important to my mind is that for the first time in the history of the transatlantic alliance, we are seeing the Europeans not just take on their fair share of the burdens, burden of security, but in fact, take on the lion's share. Because in a situation where our most important sanctions are financial sanctions and export controls, the Europeans are actually taking on most of that. Now, that is because our economies are much more exposed to Russia's economy than America's is. You can only you can see that if you only look at the amount of oil and gas that we import. America imports relatively little, so it's fairly easy for it to forgo that, to shut that off. It's much more difficult for Europeans, which is why we're having this discussion right now. But you can, you know, you can say that's to some degree our fault that we enabled that, as Celia was saying earlier. But it also means that the sanctions are meaningful because we are willing to pay a very real cost. So that's one point. The other point that I would make, though, that I don't think that we would be here where we are with this unity and this willingness to shoulder exceptional burdens and costs without the extraordinarily effective diplomacy of the Biden administration. In particular, I think we have to acknowledge that the Biden administration gave the German government, the outgoing Merkel government and the incoming traffic light coalition of Chancellor Olaf Scholz, a massive advance in trust. And I think it was that massive advance that I think assuaged some of the fears and the distrust in some of our smaller Eastern European neighbors who were worried that we would continue to balance and or, or perhaps even to appease um, the Kremlin. And we finally ended up living up to that in the last week of February with the de facto cancellation of Nord Stream 2, the sanctions, weapons deliveries, and then the extraordinary announcements of Olaf Scholz's speech. But those two things really go together. Both sides, the Americans and the Europeans, doing something very unusual for them. And I think that the irony here is that, <laughs> remember that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who is a German, was derided at the outset of her presidency when she said that she wanted to put in place a geopolitical commission. And this was seen as grandstanding and uh, and as a completely empty bluff. And it turns out, well, that's exactly what we're doing. This prospect of building back up European security, rearming Europe, to put it somewhat callously and, and not precisely, but rebuilding that security capacity is particularly interesting, it strikes me, and challenging because, of course, European security exists on so many overlapping layers. You have independent independent national policies, uh, particularly of major military powers like France and Germany. Then you have the European Union overlay, and by that I mean you know the array of European institutions, but primarily the European Union that has its own security coordinating function. And then, of course, you have the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, that doesn't cover the same exact territory or states as European Union uh, and other European institutions, but there is a substantial overlap, and particularly with the major military powers. How does this reconstitution of European Europe's military capacity fit into those different layers? Or do we not know yet? How do European leaders seem to be leaning towards navigating the different intense relationships that inherently exist in, in modern Europe today? Celia, I'll start with you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I believe, you know, Constanza is, is going to be the, the the expert on these questions of defense and security and NATO and European Union. I'm, I'm not at all. And But I, I will just point out to one fact and maybe one paradox. We've seen the strong reaction from Europeans. We have laid out uh, earlier, both of us, uh, these, this strong reaction, especially striking coming out of uh, Germany, but uh, also the the entire union has um, made uh, really incredible uh, advances on that front. All of these point out, though, to uh, the the concept that um, Emmanuel Macron has put forward of building Europe's sovereignty. So people would you will use sometimes words such as uh, resilience instead of of sovereignty, but basically the idea would be to transform Europe in a in, into a power, as um, 
Constance said, uh, you know, it's the geopolitical commission for a new European power that is being built at the moment. The phrase, the French phrase that is not as relevant probably as before uh, might be Europe's strategic autonomy. Because what I'm struck by is that in this reaction, uh, member states will focus on increasing their own capacities. So it's very clear in the case of Germany, but it's also the case in France that is uh, working on uh, uh, shifting some uh, priority uh, out of uh, sort of focusing on the instruments needed for uh, counterterrorism towards instrument needed for high intensity battles, the type of which we might need in the future, God forbid. But so member states are focusing on their national capacities very much. And then you have NATO as sort of the other element in in the defense side. What I think will feel less relevant would be an autonomous, a pursuit for an autonomous uh, European uh, mission and drive just because the stakes are too high, just because we're talking about Russia and the presence of the US and all NATO uh, allies together as a as you know a bulwark against russia is just so fundamental but i actually would love to to hear constance on that so yeah of course i agree with celia you know one of the absurdities of the eu versus nato debate has always been that we're talking about mostly the same countries there's only a handful of countries that aren't in one or the other and interestingly we're seeing a moment now when countries that have hesitated to join nato are actually seriously debating it. We have polls in Finland and in Sweden suddenly showing big pluralities or even majorities for the first time advocating joining NATO. And while the governments, I think, aren't at that point quite yet, they have been committing to spending 2% of defense and uh, of their of their gross national product on defense and signing agreements on closer cooperation with NATO and the US, which is remarkable because particularly the Nordic governments were always extremely circumspect about their relationship with Russia. So arguably, Putin really has reinforced, reinvigorated NATO's, NATO in ways that were thought almost unconceivable a year ago. That said, I think it's what if there's one thing that this war has taught us is that there is really a strategic continuum between the specific power assets of the European Union and and of NATO, which is that for the first time we're seeing the conjoined financial power, the regulatory power of the EU over things like export controls come to the fore in ways that we have not seen in previous conflicts. And I think that the fact that the US and, and Europe are collaborating on truly fierce financial sanctions, particularly with regard to the freezing of Russia's central bank assets, will have a severe constraining effect on on Russian political and military options in the very near future. So as Celia was saying earlier, these sanctions are not deterrent because it's at this point, I think, obvious that Putin is almost undeterrable, at least by by, by the West. He might be deterrable by his inner circle um, or turnable but but that's another question that all that said what we are seeing here is a highly unusual example of sort of almost exquisitely fine-tuned collaboration between the Biden administration the European Union and NATO I have been writing about this topic uh, as a journalist and as a think tanker for nearly 30 years and I have never seen anything like this But this is also the year of uh, the U.S. midterms, and there will be a presidential election in two years. And of course, the thought at the back of many Europeans' minds is what happens if the Americans elect a Republican Congress uh, in November? And what happens if in two years there is a return of Trumpism? What does that do to this transatlantic unity? Now, I think, you know, sane American security experts, whether Democrats or Republicans, I think will acknowledge that Europe is a not just nice to have, but but essential power asset for America, in particularly in any coming rivalry with China, 
and that there is a deep economic integration across the transatlantic space between America and Europe. That that means, again, that we are stronger when working together, even if that cooperation is focused on our economies rather than on, on our militaries. But a return of Trumpism, I think, would would I think raise some really serious questions about the security of Europe. And while I think we've all learned in this conflict that um, European autonomy and autarky is unrealistic, I think that with that at the back of people's minds, people are going to think very seriously about at least making Europe able to act for itself in smaller or to midsize emergencies. Well, Kaz, let me let me drill down with you a little bit more on that because that's actually exactly the next issue I, I wanted to turn to is is the U.S. role in all this, and not just the United States. I think the other non-European powers in NATO as well, but really we're talking primarily about the United States. How does that unpredictability about U.S. commitment to NATO, um, which we saw under serious, I think, great credible threat during the Trump administration, we were reminded of that just in the last week when former National Security Advisor John Bolton confirmed that you know President Trump tr- almost withdrew from NATO in 2018, and that Bolton posited that like he likely would have done so if he'd been reelected, um, and there is no currently legal barrier preventing a president from doing that in the United States. Although you know there's some proposals to do something like that in Congress, what, how does that impact how Europe cultivates its ability here? Because of course you know you have the model of being under the U.S. security umbrella that puts a large onus on the United States' willingness to actually engage militarily. But there's other, le- which which is brought into question, I think, by Trumpism most squarely because of the skepticism of European alliances that you hear President Trump and a lot of people around him speak of frequently. There's other types of relationships as well. There's arms development and arms sales and the cultivation of military technology, some of which Europe is very advanced in, other ones we aren't. And Europe more broadly, it's worth noting, has a bit of a hodgepodge in this area. We see this now in Ukraine as uh, you know, certain Eastern European states are still using Russian-provided and even Soviet-era equipment from MiG jets and other sorts of equipment that now there's an effort to transfer to Ukraine because they're on the same system, even though those other states are part of the European security apparatus. So what does autarky mean for Europe in this sort of mean? What's realistic for them to develop? And in what areas is the tied to the United States and the outside world likely to inevitably be part of the picture, at least for the foreseeable future? So first off, I think we shouldn't use the word autarky because I think that's that's unrealistic. I think what we can aim for and should aim for is a resilience, in other words, fortifying our, our, our defenses better than we do now by reducing things like energy dependency on, on Russia by making sure that we don't sell off our um, physical or digital infrastructure to China, ports and, and 5G networks, and that kind of thing. That, that doesn't, you know, that, that would you know, significantly fortify our, our position without an actual military expense, right? And as we have now understood, for open interdependent societies like ours, that's actually really important. And we have completely under invested in resilience, not least because so many of these assets that need to be made more resilient are not in government ownership, they're in private ownership, and private companies, you know, would prefer not have, not to have to spend money or to be told to spend money on these things. That probably has to change. But we, I think, you know, have always in the past planned for really quite massive operations where the American force backbone was essential and that were so large that even the big three in Europe, the Brits, the French, and the Germans would not be able to replace that backbone. And as it turned out in the Libya intervention in 2012, which really wasn't that large, um, it turned out that that the Americans still had to, who were trying to hang back under the Obama administration, still had to supply us with, with essentials like missiles, platforms, and so on. But I think that we could conceptualize small to medium size operations in the Mediterranean, for example, or um, smaller peacekeeping and stabilization missions in Europe's periphery or in Africa by thinking of British, French, or German forces as the backbone for these operations. These things don't really have to be that big. And we need to be able to say, to the smaller nations who at this point 
really don't have full spectrum forces. They have boutique capabilities, some of which are very useful and very valuable. You can come and we will supply the essentials, the logistics, the transportation, the big forces, and you can bring your specialized capabilities and we will mesh them together. And in fact, that's something that the Germans at any rate have really been working on with some of their neighboring countries. Most effectively, I think with the Dutch, but they've also worked quite hard at reaching out to the Eastern Europeans to do that. But I think in the in a case of major territorial war, which I think still, you know, barring a sort of an all out, you know, craziness coming from the Kremlin, we are not looking at, that would be catastrophic, but still I think is the least likely proposition we're looking at here. What we really need is small-ish, highly capable, very flexible forces that can be very quickly deployed. And we, I think, also need to look at improving our deterrent and defense capabilities. That's something we haven't really been willing to look at for a long time because that was such a Cold War thing to think about. So uh, maybe as my last point, We've we've seen a lot happening in this space since Russia's the beginning of Russia's war against Ukraine on February 24th. But there is a lot more in that space that I think needs to happen. Um, for example, we are still, in theory, the Russia NATO Founding Act of 1997, which forbids permanent deployment along NATO's eastern flanks, is still in theory in existence, but I think that the Russians have blown that off the table. So we should start discussing permanent deployments of troops to uh, Eastern flank countries. That's one thing. The other thing we could be discussing is intermediate range NATO missile stationing in answer to Russia's ability to send such missiles from Kaliningrad into Europe. I think that would be a very significant sign. And finally, and, and this perhaps brings us back to Celia, I think that particularly if there is a political shift in America, either this year or in two years, I think that you are going to see a revival of debate about the Europeanization of the nuclear deterrent of of the UK and France. That's not to suggest that I think that the French and the Brits would share their nuclear deterrent with us, but I think you would you might see a debate about cost sharing, about um, adaptation of nuclear participation and doctrine and things like that. All of all of these three things that I've just outlined, I think are potentially on the cards with what Putin is doing and would be very significant shifts, which might I think at least by the Biden administration might even be welcomed. Celia, that question about the United Kingdom actually is a perfect entree into into my next question, which I want to direct towards you, which is obviously the another major actor, particularly in the military side in Europe, is the United Kingdom, which is now in a position where it's not part of the European Union, uh, still has close economic ties, close political ties in various ways, um, is part of NATO. How does the UK seem to be fitting into these discussions about the European security architecture? Is it likely to be a you know equal partner on the security level, even though politically it's not as integrated as the core European Union member states? Are we likely to look at them being a partner as opposed to a part of whatever that architecture is that comes forward? How does the UK seem likely to fit into this picture? I have no straight answer to that question. This is uh, quite perplexing. And I think we have only started to see what is the new post-Brexit British foreign policy uh, in the world through, uh, you know, if you remember, the UK published its integrated review, uh, sort of um, thinking of itself as a more of a global power and tackling on specific area where the UK can have a net contribution to world security, but also uh, world prosperity and uh, uh, focusing very much on this idea that um, leaving the EU meant also for the UK to have a broader vision of the world and a broader implication beyond Europe. At the same time, this crisis is bringing back the territorial threat to Europe in a, in, in a very big way. And we've seen since the beginning of the crisis, the UK being very assertive and forthful in defending Ukraine, sending and communicating about uh, sending arms to Ukraine to defend itself, uh, being very much on the side of NATO, the US, the rest of transatlantic partners. And, and, and in this context, uh, the UK is 
obviously a relevant, important uh, partner to the rest of uh, Europeans. But it always faces the risk of being overshadowed either on one side by the U.S. or on the other side by other uh, European partners. But as a third country partner, it is fundamental. France, when Brexit happened, France really lost a strong partner within the EU for security and defense investments, for, uh, as um, Constance mentioned, for intervention outside of, of Europe as well. And uh, has been keen, you know, France has been keen on trying to protect this uh, relationship. And, and it's probably the one area where um, there is less friction between France and the UK because the conviction is that they need each other. Long term, though, I'm, I'm unsure of um, how this will evolve and whether, you know, the UK will want to assert itself in different ways. I think it it is facing uh, the, the reality. It was hoping to become really this global power and have uh, maybe, you know, we've seen that with the AUKUS crisis that um, the, or crisis, the AUKUS decision to enter in this nuclear submarine deal with Australia and the US that, uh, you know, was done on the back of the French deal for submarines with Australia. We saw there that the UK has this uh, ambition to remain a Pacific power, to remain uh, a strong player. But again, in this crisis, uh, the UK very much uh, suffers from from not being in the EU anymore and uh, not exactly being the US. So it's it's always a junior partner to someone. So, so I think uh, all of this is not clearly defined yet. And there's enough pieces moving around that we we shall see how it develops. I know we're almost out of time, but I have one last question I want to put to you all, which kind of gets at back to this kind of fundamental idea about how Europe and Europeans are thinking about security on the continent. And that's the idea about what does this reconstitution and rebuilding of the European security order, the reconstruction of it, uh, or, or reconception of it, maybe I should say, mean for the idea of Europe? There was once this idea, you know, going back to the 1990s of Europe really being the con as a whole, reaching even to Russia at some point, um, even though EU membership obviously is is kind of a, a process. There was an idea that like culturally they're all part of a cultural and political whole and the idea would be to eventually, you know, have a more unified concept of Europe. Um, that's, I think, taken a lot of hits over the subsequent years, um, to say the least, uh, not least because of Russian strong objections, particularly in recent years. But what does the need to build up a strong Europe militarily from a defense perspective mean for Europe's relationship on its periphery? Those states, a lot, mostly former Soviet states in particular, that obviously have some, a lot of cultural ties to Europe, but also very strong cultural ties to Russia. Does it mean that Europe is going to be reaching out to them, solidifying those relationships before Russia has a chance to object militarily, or is it to approach them more conservatively? You know, one of the most interesting developments related to Ukraine is this kind of rush Ukraine membership in the European Union that we've seen taking place that is seems largely symbolical. I welcome correction if I'm wrong about that, but nonetheless, it's kind of a notable in its uh, symbolic significance that EU membership is is being extended so readily in opposition to Russian aggression. How is that logic going to extend to other states that are on that periphery between Russia and Europe? Constanza, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. So your question touches on what has been an eternal conundrum for the European Union and one that it has never really satisfactorily resolved which is where does Europe end? Now, it has basically extended uh, or, or reached the end of its options in the north. It's bounded to the west by the North Sea at the Atlantic Ocean. You've seen the UK having left that part of Europe, but I think currently seriously rediscovering the merits of working together with Europe. I think that that we're currently seeing a real, perhaps a sea change in in UK leaders' willingness to cooperate, even you know with Brexit remaining a political fact. 
And in the south, I think the Mediterranean is a natural boundary. But in the east, we have always had the question of just how far does Europe go? And what you had really was Eastern European nations who were worried about Russia, and as we know, with good reason, worried, pushing for membership from really the demise of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact in 1991 onwards, and meeting with really quite considerable resistance, especially in Germany, but I think if I remember correctly, also in France and other countries, and American, successive American administrations making it a priority to sort of, shall we say, massage European attitudes to this. And the result of that was that we ended up having several rounds of enlargement until it, for the EU and, and NATO as well, until we're, both of those organiza organizations were up to nearly 30 members, which does, of course, make organizing consensus and uh, joint action, if we're honest, more difficult than it was when those institutions were notably smaller. And it has also been, become particularly problematic in an era of populist democratic rollback in some of these countries. That was a really concerning phenomenon, both, both for the European Union and for NATO. But what we're seeing now is yet another country, Ukraine, um, making very serious pitch for admittance and Europeans very seriously willing to consider that. Now, I think what was discussed at this informal summit in Versailles this week was a willingness to entertain a process that would be tailor-made where we would be working with Ukraine to help it along a path of transformation of its economy, its society, its democratic institutions in such a way that at the end, the question of member membership kind of answers itself. But the truth is also that a country that is being besieged, that is being invaded by a great power, is in no position to, to join immediately, nor are we in a position to let it in. Even in peacetime, the question of the absorption capability of Ukraine and of the European Union for such a large country and with such such issues to to join what is, after all, not just an alliance, but a genuinely partially super, supranational arrangement, uh, it would have been a really big issue. But but still, it, the, the fact that we are all willing to discuss this and to figure out how we can do this pragmatically represents a massive change. And of course, that has implications for the region. It has implications for Belarus, and it has implications for the Caucasus, for Georgia in particular. And uh, the Georgians have wanted to join NATO and perhaps not quite as much the EU for, for a very long time. And in Belarus, you don't have the opposition isn't saying that, but you have a very vibrant opposition that after the latest crackdowns by by the Belarusian dictator Lukashenko has had to move to outside of uh, outside of Belarus, but is I think still very active and very networked. So the current events, this war, raises a host of questions about Europe's eastern future, and I think that none of us are really quite in a position to speculate now with any with any real credibility on where the, where this will head. But it is really the most remarkable development, I think, since we took in the first Eastern European nations, the, the three Baltic republics in the in the early 90s. This is this is, again, uh, you know, it would be a different European Union and a different NATO, frankly. Uh, just a word, um, because we are less than months out from the first round of the French presidential election, I am mindful that, uh, you know, not every European citizen, of course, or French citizen share um, the sort of uh, pro-EU, pro-NATO, and even pro-enlargement um, discourse that we are hearing uh, from uh, the French government at the moment or uh, from Brussels at the moment. And, and even if uh, everybody understands, as Constance uh, really pointed out, that, uh, you know, Ukraine's 
membership into the EU is not for tomorrow. It's going to take a long process. There, there is constituency. There are constituencies in France that are pretty strong. It's probably at least a third of France that have extremely different views of the role of the EU uh, in the world, very different views on enlargement, very much uh, opposed to it for for a variety of different reasons. Um, and they're also, I must say, uh, often opposed to the idea of a European, uh, European strategic autonomy, European um, sometimes against European increase uh, of European capacity to defend itself and security, etc. Because you have several camps. You have the nationalists, the ones we know best, the Marine Le Pen, Eric Zemmour, uh, that are uh, against uh, the institutions of Brussels, against, and you know, they're promoting the idea of a Europe of nations. So basically, as if European countries were cooperating and collaborating, but not giving up any uh, inch of sovereignty to Brussels. But you also have an, another camp that are the pacifists, that are uh, sort of making a comeback with this war, uh, the one who basically say that the European project should forever remain a sort of a project for peace and prosperity in the world, should not arm itself, should not, uh, and should fundamentally work on projects such as climate action, um, such as development, prosperity, inventing a new world. And this is also making sort of a comeback because, uh, you know, as, as, as a sort of an alternative to what is today the, the French government position. So I don't believe these are majoritarian uh, views at the moment, but when this crisis settles, we might see a comeback of, of European Eurosceptics in many different ways, and we should never discount that these are going to sort of tame down uh, the integrationist moment that we are, we are currently knowing and, and, and will pro propose alternative futures as well, whether you, we like it or not. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we have to leave the conversation there. But thank you both for joining us here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having us on. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And look out for Lawfare's other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, and our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to the January 6th insurrection, The Aftermath. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a material supporter of Lawfare at www.patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. For example, this Thursday, March 17th at noon Eastern time, I'll be answering any questions you may have about Ukraine-related sanctions at our weekly Lawfare Live online event. Also, be sure to visit lawfareblog.com for our extensive written coverage of national security law and policy issues as well as thelawfarestore.com for all of your lawfare swag needs. This podcast was edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and our audio engineer was Hemza Shatu of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.